Miracy. Hi, it's Cynthia Lamb, producer of the show. If you're like most listeners of Soul Savvy Business, you like to look beneath the surface of a situation to understand what makes it tick. That's why I'm excited to introduce a new addition to the Miracy FM podcast network. It's called Neuroscience of Coaching, and it's hosted by Dr. Irina O'Brien. In each episode, Irina explains the science-based insights behind a particular concept and interviews a coach to discuss how these apply in the real world. To give you a taste of it, I'm running an episode right here in the Soul Savvy Business feed. I chose this particular episode because Irina and her guest, Melinda Cohen, discuss motivation, which can be a real challenge for entrepreneurs. And as you'll see, the conventional wisdom concerning motivation isn't always so wise. If you like what you hear, make sure to find Neuroscience of Coaching in your favorite podcast player and follow it. And that is the beauty of small tasks, right? You don't have to push that boulder up the hill. You're pushing pebbles up the hill when you break things down, but you're still getting to the top of the hill. Hi, I'm Dr. Irene O'Brien and you're listening to Neuroscience of Coaching. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist with almost 30 years of study and practice in psychology and neuroscience. And as the founder of the Neuroscience School, I teach coaches and other wellness professionals practical, evidence-based strategies to use in their own practices. I'm passionate about uncomplicating subjects and clarifying information to help more people understand their unwanted behaviors, as well as their power to change them. So in each episode, I introduce a topic or concept that coaching clients struggle with, bringing listeners the latest scientific research in psychology and neuroscience. I invite a seasoned coach to discuss the topic with me, and together, we provide you, the listener, with useful science-based tools to help your clients reach their goals by working with their brains rather than against their brains. In today's episode, we'll be discussing a topic that I know many people struggle with, motivation. Motivation is essentially having the energy to pursue a goal. Sounds simple, right? Well, for those of you rolling your eyes right now, stay tuned, because it can be a lot easier than you think. Many people use techniques like self-talk, visualization, mantras, and even pure willpower in an effort to increase motivation only to find that these methods rarely work. Mindset is not enough, and here's why. They're not starting from a foundation of success. Research shows that it's important to break down goals into small, achievable steps. When we complete a task successfully, the brain releases a burst of dopamine, which makes it more likely that we'll succeed on the next task. Dopamine is sometimes called the pleasure hormone, the happy hormone, or the feel-good hormone because it gives you a sense of pleasure. And it also gives you the motivation to do something when you're feeling pleasure, like starting on the next small task. You can set up your day as a series of small achievable tasks. Small steps don't mean that you can't have your big goal. You absolutely can. But when you break down your big goal into the small steps, you can keep dopamine high all day. Teresa Alabiel and Stephen Kramer from Harvard Business School found that small, achievable steps in meaningful work not only increases motivation, it can also start an upward spiral where progress and motivation fuel each other, and they call this the progress loop. So for that reason, our primary goal is to always begin building that momentum knowing that even if there are setbacks, obstacles, or challenges, we can reframe and redirect to the next small but meaningful task, one that we know we can achieve. I often hear coaches say, start with the most important thing first, but that's not necessarily a good idea. If that most important thing is the one that freaks you out, then it may not be a good idea. You may want to start that upward spiral with another task before you tackle that most important thing. For example, let's go back to the situation of being stuck on a goal-related task. If you observe that your thoughts at that time of overwhelm are all eye-centered, I can't do this, I'll never finish this, I can't figure this out, I'm not smart or talented or confident enough, you're operating in the default mode network 
another important concept we're addressing today. The default mode network is a set of brain structures that's active when we're in our internal thoughts. It's not capable of focusing on the task in front of us, so don't ask it to. If you slipped into the default mode network, it's no big deal though. Recognize it, don't beat yourself up, and switch to the attention network. The attention network is a set of brain structures that is active when we're working on external tasks. And the thing is, you can't be in the two networks at the same time because they work in opposition to each other. But you can practice being intentional about noticing which network you're using and deciding which one you choose to activate. No amount of willing yourself to focus on a task from your default mode network will ever work because that very effort means you're still in the default mode network. So take a pause and intentionally focus on something external to you. Look around the room, notice the items in it without judging them, of course, because then you'll be right back into the default mode network. Or look at a tree outside your window, or even just start on a small task. All these things get your mind out of the default mode network and into the attention network. And I use this strategy all the time. I suffer from anxiety and there are days when I find it hard to work up the motivation to start working. But not working during the week is not an option. So what I do when I realize I'm in the default mode network is I start on a small, achievable task that I enjoy. So I'll often choose an accounting task. I used to be a CPA, so accounting is easy for me. And this task is still important. It keeps me moving forward and starts my upward spiral so I can tackle other, more difficult tasks. So if you are aware of your own brain activity, what's going on, and what you can change about it, you are powerfully equipped to change your thoughts and behaviors so that you can lead the life that you want. I'm thrilled to introduce my guest for this topic, Melinda Cohen. Melinda is the CEO of the Coaches Console, a seven-figure software training and coaching company that has helped thousands of coaches create profitable and thriving businesses. Plus, she's the host of her own podcast, Just Between Coaches, which is also on the Miracy FM network. As a neuroscience hobbyist, she is no stranger to these concepts. So I'm really looking forward to diving into all of this with her today. So welcome to the show, Melinda. Hey, Irina. I'm so excited to be here. And I am a neuroscience hobbyist. Not much more than that, but I do love this topic. I am so fascinated for our conversation today. So I'm so happy to have you, like, especially since I know that you're a self-described neuroscience geek. So can you tell us a little bit more about who you serve and how you came to be doing the work you're doing? So the people that I love working with are coaches and really all sorts of service-based entrepreneurs that are wanting to make a big impact in this world, wanting to help others experience transformation in all different areas of their lives. And they're experiencing overwhelm in their business. They're frustrated by everything that they have to do in their business. They're not even sure what to do next or where to look, but they just know they're meant to be doing this work in the world. And so through our software, the Coaches Console, through our training and coaching programs, we help them exactly what you just described in the intro, break it down into small steps, taking them one at a time, step by step, click by click, so that they can take on this adventure of having their own business create income from it that they can rely on that's dependable and making that big impact in the world. And that's what I've been doing for almost 20 years now is helping coaches and entrepreneurs remove burdens and distractions of their business and step into their full potential as the coach and transformational beings and angels that they are in this world. Well, thank you for that, Melinda. And that's exactly why I do the work I do too. Right? Except I teach uh, coaches about neuroscience so that they can then help their clients be their best. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. So, you know, the default mode network and the attention network is something that most people don't know about. And I know that with my students, when I introduce this in class, they're in shock that it is really that easy to start working. It's not that hard. 
Exactly. And a lot of people, because it's so simple, it's like, well, surely that can't be right if it's that simple. But it's like, yeah, it is that simple. And I know a lot of times I would find myself wrong if I'm like, well, I'm just going to let me step away from this. Let me go for a walk or let me just stare out the window. And I'm like, no, 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 get busy. You need to be busy. Like you have to be busy to be productive, to get results. And that was the driving force for me for a long time was busy meant productive, productive meant results, result meant success. So the busier I was, the more productive I could be. And it was exhausting. I learned how to do busy very well. And I learned how to tie a pink bow around being busy because I wanted to be successful and be productive. But it wasn't until I began to really look at it from a different perspective that I could appreciate and find myself right for wanting to go for a walk or go stand out on my back deck for five minutes with my face to the sun, just taking deep breaths and then coming back in and sitting back at my desk. And that's when I could really live that idea of working smarter, not harder, getting more done in less time. I was like, oh, that, it actually, that is what happens. Yeah, I mean, those moments of rest are so important for the brain right? because the brain cannot be working nonstop at difficult tasks for hours and hours in a day, right? So we do need to take breaks and our brain needs them and our body needs them too. And we don't have to keep on pushing ourselves at 120 miles an hour. And I've learned the distinction, and I don't know if this is about the default mode network or attention network or you might be able to explain more of what this is, but I find that there's a lot to be done for projects. There might be hundreds of tasks to do, and it's a lot of work, but it doesn't feel like hard work in the sense of pushing that boulder up the hill. It's like I'm on a hard hike for sure, but I'm not trying to force something to happen. And I don't mind working hard, but I do not like pushing the boulder up the hill. I don't like forcing things. No, exactly. And that is the beauty of small tasks, right? You don't have to push that boulder up the hill. You're pushing pebbles up the hill when you break things down, but you're still getting to the top of the hill. There was another thing that you said, start with the most important thing first. And then you're like, well, maybe not. And I find that to be very true because often the most important thing is the one that is usually the most difficult to do or the thing that maybe you've never done before, so you don't know how to do it just because it's new. And when we attach that meaning of, well, this is the most important thing I need to do, it, it's high risk. And therefore, you know, there'll be resistance to taking any sort of step. It's like, well, I don't want to get this wrong. But when you said, don't start with the most important thing first, but what I say to myself is, what's a quick win I can get right now? Let me start there. Exactly. I do that too. And I call it priming the pump. Mm, mm -hmm. I need to prime the pump before I tackle that the most important thing, which is often the scariest thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so I personally, I'm very mindful of starting that upward spiral. Right. And once you start that, it just takes on a life of its own. Right. You can just keep going all day and you have your dopamine, your bursts of dopamine, and then you start on the next task. And you can accomplish a great deal without feeling like you've been pushing that boulder up the hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that upward spiral, that momentum and priming the pump. And then there's this, you know, I might be able to get 10 or 12 tasks accomplished in a 30 minute period of time where if I'm trying to push the boulder up a hill, I may not even get one accomplished in that same time frame. Yeah, exactly. And it's easier than you think. It's not difficult to get into that flow. Yeah. And sometimes you have to stop forcing. In order to start, I find that I have to stop forcing. Sometimes when we're forcing things also, it's because our brain is tired and we need to take a break. I find that that happens with me. I, when I start going around in circles, oh, I look at my watch. Okay, how long have I been working? Oh, it's been 45 minutes or an hour. Time for a break. Yeah. And it's like a miracle. So I heard you say when you first came on is that you do that with your clients. You help them break things down into small steps. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I find that, you know, the number one word that our students and clients use is overwhelm, right? They're all starting a business. They're in somewhere on their business journey and they're overwhelmed. It's what we hear from probably 98% of the people. 
And the first thing it tells me is they're in that fight, flight, or freeze mode, right? The survival state has kicked in because they're perceiving something about their journey is not safe or okay, or they don't feel good to move forward. And the overwhelm is caking on so that our brains and our bodies and our beings are saying, alert, alert, do not feel these yucky feelings and these emotions that are scary about your whatever you're working on. Just stay right here so you don't have to go into that dangerous territory. So that's the freeze mode. Our brain and body is trying to keep us in this freeze mode. And overwhelm is how we know we're in freeze mode. And so when I hear people talking about that, it's like, okay, how can we unfreeze? What needs to happen so that we feel safe to take the next step. That's all. That's the only thing that we need to look at is what's the next step that we can take. And sometimes, you know, if they're trying to, what's an example? They're like, I've got to build a website. Well, you know, that's like leaping the Grand Canyon and there's all sorts of stuff that happens. So it's like, okay, let's break that down. Oh, well, I need to get my list building funnel in place and my optimum. And now there is like, okay, well, that still is daunting. And so we just keep breaking it down until they don't have that panic sound in their voice or the crinkle in their forehead. And they're like, oh, well, I actually just need to create a headline and three bullet points that I'm going to put on a page. Oh, I can do that. Oh, okay, there's. And so as soon as the there's no crinkles in the forehead... And the voice is a little, oh, lighter. It's like, okay, now we're back in the realm of where we can move forward from. So, yeah. So do you find that they're creating that upward spiral or that momentum? Eventually they do. Because as soon as they see that first task, they're like, oh my gosh, that was easy. Like that phrase right there, when one of our clients says, that was easy, it's like a reserve has just been put in the bank. It's like, and now they're building. It's like, okay, what's the next thing you can do? Don't, no, 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 don't go too far. Like, no, no, just what's the next thing you can do? And as soon as they say, oh, I did it, or oh my gosh, that was amazing, or like that's the indicator that the momentum is happening, the reserves are building, and now they're in that upward spiral. It's begun. And so we just look for more opportunities for that to happen. And now you know the neuroscience behind that. Yeah, that's awesome. So do you find that some clients just fight breaking things down into small steps? They want their big goals? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fight is a good word. Wrestle would be another good word. (laughs) They do. And more times than not, it's because they've been telling this story for so long. They've been in this spot for so long that they just don't know how to think or feel or behave any other way. It's just what they know. It's become their norm. And more times than not, they're just not even aware that they're doing it. Yeah. And I find that people who fight breaking down goals into small steps, it's often because they believe that they're going to make less progress that way. But in fact, you're going to make greater progress by breaking things down. Yeah, exactly. So we did talk a little bit about the default mode network. So I find that many people have an aha moment when they realize that they can't use the default mode network and the attention network at the same time. And it's almost as if they realize they have a new superpower. And it is. It really feels like a superpower to be able to intentionally switch between the two. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up. I didn't know the labels of the default mode network or the label of attention network. But many years ago, we saw all of our clients not all of them, but as we would take them on the journey. So they're in our program, they're with us for 12 weeks. And about three or four weeks into it, we noticed that percentage of them would just keep on going. They'd stay in the flow, keep making progress. They'd make their way. They'd be successful and get results. But there was a percentage of them at that same point, they would start to disconnect and disengage and disappear. And it's like, what happened? Like they just stay stuck and nothing would change. And it's like, what's going on? So I really dove into that and I started looking at their behaviors. What are they thinking? What are they saying? What are they doing? And one of the things that we discovered is that there are these patterns and tendencies, the fight, flight, and freeze characteristics and attributes. We called them villains. We actually turned them into characters and called them villains so that people could more easily identify when it was showing up. And then we didn't want them to just... It wasn't enough for us for them to say, oh, I know what villain that is, and now I see why I'm getting stuck. But we actually then named the counterpart and created the superpower. And when that superpower is showing up, this is the thoughts you're thinking. These are the behaviors that you're emulating. So I didn't know it officially, but unofficially, I think that's what we created. Now I've got an actual label for it, an official term. 
Yeah. And so mindset, I mean, mindset is, it's kind of like, like all coaches talk about mindset, right? And people think that they, they're trying to work up the motivation because they think that they have to want to do whatever it is that they have to do, right? But it doesn't work that way because you could sit at your desk all day long and still not want to do it. Right. You could have the best mantra, but if your brain is like, well, BS, I'm not going to believe that no matter what, like you can repeat the mantra however many times you want to, it's not going to work. But I think, you know, mindset's an interesting word. And I find that when I bring that up in conversation, it either pisses people off or it has them lean in to want to know more. There's very few conversations where it's like, okay, yeah, whatever mindset. Like people are either fascinated by it or pissed off by it. And, and I think it's an overused word. Absolutely. I think people have used it in a lot of wrong contexts. So I think there's a lot of different aspects to mindset. I'm a big believer that our thoughts become things. Like what we think about is what we bring about into our life. So we can think about it and then we have to have action. I think the thoughts, the actions, the emotions, I think they all intertwine and fuel the motivation for creating outcomes in our human lives. Yeah, exactly. I mean, our words create our reality, even our internal words and create our reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me, Melinda, what is it about neuroscience that lights you up? Well, I've been so fascinated with several topics, the topic of transformation as we're working with our clients, but just a lot of different, like one of the things that I love doing is I love dance breaks. Now, am I a good dancer? No. Did I used to not want to dance because I thought people would look at me and have a lot of judgment? Yes, but now I love it. And when somebody shared with me the neuroscience behind dance break and what was happening in my brain as to why I felt so good in my body, that just was, I was like, oh my gosh, it's a whole new world up there of what's going on. And so the other thing that I love is self-care. Anybody knows that anything about me, I'm the queen of self-care. And probably over the last, I don't know, eight, 10 years have really dove into that. It's one of my superpowers that helps me lead my business, lead my team, just create my incredible life. And when I began to really understand the neuroscience behind self-care, it's like, oh, self-care is not a reward to give yourself when you do something. It's actually how you show up so that you can accomplish something. And it just, when I began to understand the neuroscience behind these feeling aspects that I was experiencing, my brain was happy and my body was happy. And it just created almost this unity within me, this alignment within me that just... I don't know whether I'm looking at the neuroscience of business or the neuroscience of dance breaks or the neuroscience of self-care or the neuroscience of transformation when I'm working with our clients on their journey of transformation. It just brings an added fuel that increases the internal motivation for wanting me to do more, feel more, be more. I just love it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I find neuroscience, obviously, I mean, because of what I do, but I find uh, neuroscience is just fascinating. I can't get enough. And it's changed my life. And my students tell me that for many of their clients, and there's a certain segment of clients, like the more technical, who really embrace change wholeheartedly once they learn about how the brain is involved in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been so fun over the recent years diving into this exploration and talking about it from a lot of different perspectives. Yeah, it's really been fun now to be in this field because the research on the mind-body connection is so ripe now. So I'm passionate about those things, about the mind-body connection. So yeah, it's a great time to be in this field. It really is. And I think we're just getting started. I think we're just at the very beginning of it. Thank you, Melinda. This was so amazing. It's always nice to chat with you. Oh my gosh. I always learn so much whenever we have conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. So again, if you're finding yourself trying to work up the motivation to start, you're in the default mode network where success is not possible. To shift into the attention network, just start on a small, achievable, and meaningful task. And when you start each day this way, you can build a productive day.
I'm Dr. Irene O'Brien, and you've been listening to Neuroscience of Coaching. You can find out more about me at neuroscienceschool.com. Neuroscience of Coaching is part of the Mirror CFM podcast network, which also includes shows such as Just Between Coaches and Once Upon a Business. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. I wrote this episode with Melissa Deal. Melissa assembled the episode. Danny Innie is our executive producer. And post-production was by Marvin Del Rosario. To make sure you don't miss great episodes coming up on Neuroscience of Coaching, please follow us on Mirror CFM's YouTube channel or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a comment or a star review. It is the best way to help us get these ideas out there to more people. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.